Good morning. It's always that I have the privilege of saying good morning and welcoming you. <laughs> Bob, that was a night. That's not the right key for me, Bob. <laughs> but we're glad to have you here. Let me do this first this morning. Uh, it, with your permission, we have some guests with us, and I want you to introduce your guests, please. Stand up and introduce your guests. No, one moment. Go ahead. Go, go on. This is Elizabeth and Donald. And she's from where? Annapolis, Maryland. Annapolis? Yes. Okay. Who's going to do this one? Gordon, you or Pat? Um, Pat's going to stand up and introduce them. Just below Valdosta, Georgia. All right. Um, John, you want anybody to introduce you? <laughs> John and his wife are here. We're always glad to have them down from King George. Y'all got any visitors up there? No? All right. All right. Are you ready to sing then? All right, let's stand. Let's sing together our opening song. All hail King Jesus. As they continue playing, will you welcome and greet one another where you are, please? Thank you, thank you, and if you'll remain standing, please. Uh, if you've read a little, if you've seen your bulletin, it's an amazing day because of amazing grace. That's what the service is all about this morning. So we're going to sing perhaps what is perhaps the most familiar hymn in the hymn book. Tyler, you know how to play this one? <laughs>
thank you, thank you, and you may be seated. As always, we do welcome you and thank you for being present in the Lord's house on the Lord's day, sharing together in this manner. For our visitors, we are grateful. And for others who may have been absent for a little while, we are thankful that you are back. By way of announcement, let me remind you that uh, we will be going to Farnham Manor at 2 o'clock to conduct services there. And if you'd like to join us, then and anyone, everyone is welcome. The deacons have a meeting on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Let me say a word about Wednesday night. We, since we, the choir does not have rehearsal during, during the month of uh, August, that means that our midweek service is the only thing we have on Wednesday night which means we have, it's open-ended, we have plenty of time, we have some wonderful discussions, a prayer time, and even have home ice, homemade ice cream at the end of it. Last week we set up the chairs all around the tables uh, and filled all but two of them. And we're gonna add some more chairs this week in anticipation of some other people who are gonna join us. We have a wonderful, wonderful time. If you don't believe that, just ask any of the, those who were here last Wednesday night, let me see where you are. Just ask any of them and see what they say. We're delighted to have you. The Pastor Search Committee, Brother Odell, I believe is meeting on Thursday night. May we anticipate a new pastor by next Sunday. <laughs> You're working on it, you're working, that's the main thing. All right, are there birthdays over here this week? Oh, we have several. Okay. Catherine, this coming Tuesday? Jeffrey? How many are you, Jeffrey? 45. 45? You're 45, all right, I'll guarantee. <laughs> any others over, any over here? In the balcony? Any anniversaries anywhere? All right, we have two, Tyler. As we come to our prayer time, the prayer needs are listed in your bulletin to the best of our knowledge. But let me call your attention to one that is not there. Uh, Rylan Dufour, as you are aware, has been in Farnham Manor for over a year now. Hasn't it been over a year? And uh, last night he fell out of the bed. He ended up with some bruises. He's at the hospital in, uh, did they keep him? Okay, and he has a, a, a young, lung, you no. Know. What is his problem, Betty? A collapsed lung, I knew that. So keep them in mind at this particular time and others that the Lord may bring to your mind as we pray together. Father, it's good to be in your house today on a beautiful day here in the month of August. We thank you for it. Pray that you will bless all who are present and bless those who can't be with us, that they may know your presence and love and goodness in a very special way. We pray for those who serve us here and to the uttermost parts of the earth, for those men and women who wear the uniforms of our country, for those who serve in various ways to protect us and to help us in our times of need. Pray for our church and the sister churches in our community that you will be with one and all as we seek to serve and honor you. And so do bless us in this service and let it be a testimony and a witness and a glory to your name. And we'll ever be thankful and grateful in the name of Jesus we make our prayer. Amen. Amen. 
As pointed out, the choir does not sing during the month of August, but we have, uh, we have musicians throughout the month, and our own Jimmy Ginn. Jimmy, get you tuned up back there? You hope so. All right. Jimmy is going to sing for us in our first, come on, Jimmy, and uh, tell us what you're going to sing, and then uh, we'll listen to it. I will. I'd just like to say that... Uh, Are you on? No, I'm not. You're not on. I knew I was going to forget that. <laughs> I'd just like... There we go. I'd just like to say to this lady that, uh, you know, it brings back memories. I was stationed in Valdosta, Georgia, in 1956 in the U.S. Air Force there in Air Training Command. And there was about 20,000 people there at the time when I was there. I can't imagine how many people there are now. Of course, there wasn't no Walmarts or anything like that, but I'm sure that it has. I've often wanted to go back through there when I went to Florida, but I never did. You know, uh, yesterday I was just looking at the clouds up in there and just thinking how beautiful they were, you know. And uh, Peggy can tell you, I do this all the time. I look up and I say, thank you, Lord. And it's almost like the clouds are, are speaking to me. And I look at the beautiful trees that we have, you know. And then I come around the corner on Route 3 and I see this beautiful church. It's a brick church, a church that the lawns are just fabulous. The, the cemetery is just beautiful. And I said, I'm part of that. Thank you, Lord, for that, you know. And, and I told Donald this morning, I think that I've been here 15 years. And I still get excited about coming to church. And I love the Lord. And I love the people here, too, you know. This song is for people that uh, kind of like me, that like last week I had a kidney infection. But the Lord come back and he healed me a little bit and it, it gives you some kind of hope, you know. And this song, this song will speak to each one of us. I better go up a little loud with that. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain. You have faith like you've never known. But when things change and you're down in that valley, don't lose hope because you're never alone. The God of the mountain, still the God in the valley. When things go wrong, He'll make it right. He's the God of the good time, still the God in the bad time. He's the God of the day, He's the God of the night. You talk of faith when you're up on the mountain. The talk comes easy when life's at its best. But when things change and you're down in the valley, that's when your faith really put to the test. All the God of the mountain, still the God in the valley, the God of the good time, the God of the bad time. He's the God of the good time, still the God in the bad time. He's the God of the day. Still the God of the night. He's the God of the day. He's the God of the night. 
Oh, my feet don't move as fast as they used to. <laughs> Donald's going to say a couple of words while I set my machine. I thought Donald was going to say something, but he didn't. <laughs> this is a song that, uh, that just means so much. Debbie Boone wrote this song and recorded it. And, you know, Pat Boone, I, how many of y'all remember Pat Boone? Pat Boone was a very popular, but to me, Debbie Boone was what I remember mostly about the Boones. And this song, you know. It relates to everybody because I really do not know anybody that, that's, that has a life of perfection. And we do go through trials and, you know, I, I think about the life of going down a road of life and it's a smooth highway and then all of a sudden it is a big old pothole and our whole life changes. There's people in this church that, that needs our prayers. And, and we do pray for those people. And we, we have feelings for you. We, you know who you are. And this song is the one that, that I really love. I'm only human. I'm just a man. Help me believe in all I can be and all that I am. Show me the stairway that I have to climb. Lord, for my sake, teach me to take one day at a time. One day at a time. Help me out, everybody. Sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking of you. Just help me today. Show me the way. One day at a time. Let's do the course again. Help me out, everybody. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I'm asking of you. Just help me today, show me the way, one day at a time. Do you remember when you walked among men? Lord, you know if you're looking below, it's worse now than then. Pushing and shoving, crowding my mind. Lord, for my sake, teach me to take one day at a time. Help me out, everybody. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. That's all I'm asking of you. Just give me the strength 
do every day what I have to do. Yesterday's gone, sweet Jesus, and tomorrow may never be mine. Well, help me today, show me the way one day at a time. Thank you. What some of you don't know is that Jimmy sings with a group and uh, they spend a lot of their time. They got how many? Two commitments today, Jimmy? Or uh, one? You have? We, we've, uh, we don't have a commitment right now. We, we will play it a. a uh, Gospel sang at uh, Colonial Beach this evening, and uh, last uh, three Sundays we've been playing, and of course I've missed a couple of Sundays, y'all know, and uh, we played at some, some churches over in, uh, in Montpelier area, and uh, just really enjoyed it. Some of the old churches there with the wooden floors, and people there just, they were just gracious, you know. We played for homecoming. Uh, three different times. <laughs> did they have lunch, Jimmy? Yes, they did, and that you that's know why was, that's that's why we go. <laughs> God bless everybody. Did you turn everything off up here, Jimmy? Yeah, I got everything off with the mic, but I will do that now. Yeah. I suppose I want to sing think, sing something while you're down there. Well, if you could do, let me know. And I'll <laughs> if I, I'll let you know, you can come unplug it. Yeah. All right, <laughs> all right, we're going to sing again, and. I mentioned that our emphasis for the day is on grace. You can read about that in your church bulletin. But we're going to sing another grace song. Grace greater than our sin. And it is. Amen. Let's stand and sing it together, please.
as we pray this morning, Mike will lead us in our prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and especially for last night's rest. We thank you for each and every blessing that you've given us. We ask that you bless the men and women of the military and their families and bring them home safely. As we give you our tithes and offerings, we ask you to bless the gift and the giver and your servant. Amen. <laughs> I need for you to remain standing, please, because believe it or not, you're the choir. All the way up there, Jared Scott, you're the choir. We have a song that I needed for this morning. You know it, the choir has sung it. Amazing grace, my chains are gone. So Cindy's going to lead us, and you're going to sing it. Everybody's going to sing it. We're not worried about keys and notes and all of that this morning. We are worried about getting the message out. All right, send it. Tyler, are you ready over there?
give yourself a hand for doing such a good job. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. You may be seated. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You know it by heart. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. You read, uh, uh, some of you, I, I guess, read the little thing in the bulletin each Sunday, but for some reason or another, which I cannot explain and I do not understand and don't need to, but I decided that uh, a message on the grace of God was proper for this morning. And then after having prepared the message for today, I decided, well, there are some others that I need to address also. And so next Sunday, I'm going to talk about another song. And that song is Blessed Assurance. And Sharon Mann is going to sing. And I'll talk about assurance in the message. And we'll go on through the entire month. But this morning, I want to talk to you about Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and what it has to say about the grace of God. You know, some words are easy to pronounce, but they are hard sometimes to define. For example, love, all of us use that word from time to time, at least we ought to, especially you husbands, but we ought to use it from time to time. But can you really define, love is and it's hard. And what about faith? We know what faith is. We all have faith, but to define it. Then we come to grace. How do you find, define grace? Grace is so and so. And so what I'd like to do this morning in our time together is to try to point out to you and to show you what grace is all about. This is what I'm going to be talking about. Oh, the meaning of grace as we understand it from the word of God. It's a well-known verse. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's a well-known song, Amazing Grace. Probably the best known song in the entire book. And so today's message, I had to give it a title Some. We're along the way, and so I want to talk to you about the reason grace is so amazing. And in order to do that, I want to use three biblical stories that you're familiar with, some of them at least, that will help us define grace. The first of the stories is one that's found that Jesus related to us, in the book of Mark about the workers in the vineyard. And to put it into context, let me just tell you the story and then I'll draw the conclusions to it. He said this man had a vineyard and the grapes apparently were ready for harvest and he went out that morning down to the uh, town center probably to enlist workers to work in the vineyard and he recruited some. And they went back to the vineyard and began to work. About nine o'clock that morning, he saw that things were not going to, were not progressing as well as he would like. And so he went back and recruited more workers in order that they might complete the job that day. At noontime, he saw that still they were not going to make the grade. And so he went back and recruited some other workers at three o'clock. And then as the day began to draw to a close, five o'clock was there and they still weren't gonna complete the job. So he went back at five o'clock in the afternoon and began to uh, enlist other workers to work on in his vineyard. And apparently they got the job done and then as was the custom in those days, pay time came. And so he called all of the men and began to pay them. And he started off with the men who had been, who went to work at five o'clock. 
and he paid them what was a day's wage. And they thought to themselves, I'm sure this is wonderful. We didn't work but a couple hours or an hour or so. We're getting paid for a full day's work. And then the men who went to work at 3 o'clock, he paid them a full day's work. And they must have thought the same thing. And I guess the guys who went to, clock, went to work 9 o'clock, they must have been licking their chops, and they were saying, man, by the time it gets to us, we're really going to have a payday. But he went down through the list. The men that went to work at, nine o at, at noon, they were paid a full day's work. The men who went to work at 3 at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, they were paid a full day's work. And the men that went to work at 6, they got a full day's wage. But they were very upset because they said, this is not fair. We've been working since 6 o'clock this morning, and it's just not fair. These guys that went to work at, 6 p at 5 p.m. in the afternoon, they, they didn't work but an hour or so, and they got them the same amount that we did. That just isn't fair. But the man said, it's my vineyard, and it's my grapes, and it's my paycheck, and I should be free to pay what I want to pay everyone. But the story is in the Bible, because the story is there, to describe for us what grace is all about. And listen to this for this preacher's definition of grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. The men who went to work at noon, the men who worked, went to work at 9 a.m., noon, 3, and 5, they got what they didn't deserve. And that's what grace is. There's not a single one of us in this room today, not one single one, who deserves the grace of God. Not one. But yet God extends his grace for God so loved the world that he gave, he gave his only begotten son. That's what grace is all about. Now some people have a problem with that, you understand. During our time in Alexandria, I taught a freewheeling class during Bible school, I mean during Sunday school, which means anybody who didn't go to a regular class were invited to sit with us in the sanctuary where I taught a Sunday school class. And the people came in. I mean, we had no age requirements, no weight requirements, no any kind of requirement. If you were there that Sunday and you didn't have anywhere to go, you could come to our class, and they did. There was one man in the class. His wife was a member of our church. He never was. But he came to that class. His name was Phil. He was a lawyer. Lived in Alexandria, but worked in Washington, D.C., and he came to that Sunday school class. After the Sunday school hour was over, he got up and left. To my knowledge, he never attended a worship service in the 30 years that we were in Alexandria. I asked him about it one day. I said, Phil, how come you come to Sunday school, but you won't come to the worship service? He said, well, in the Sunday school class, I can ask you questions. If I differ with you, then I can say I differ with you. But in the worship service, I can't say anything, so I'm going on home. And he went on home. He never attended, I never attended a worship service. There's an aside to that story. In 1988, I had bypass surgery, and that was the old thing where they cut you, cut you, cut you, you know. And then I, that went, made out fine and everything, but the doctor told me, I mean, this is true now. The heart doctor said, said, Mr. Bowen, in your recovery, it would be good for you to take a glass of wine every night before dinner. And I told the class what the, uh, what the doctor had told me. By the way, some of you wonder, you still, you still take that nip at the dinner? No, I took two nips, and that's all I said. 
I'll die with something or another, but I'm not going to keep this up for the rest of my life. But after telling the class that story, I walked in the class the next Sunday. Guess what was sitting on the podium of my teaching thing? A fifth of wine in a bag. It had no name on it or anything, but I, I think I know where it came from. And you know where it came from. It came from Phil, who would not attend a worship service, but, but who would attend a Sunday school class. But when we had this lesson from the vineyard, workers in the vineyard, Phil said, it's just not right. It's just not fair. The guys who worked for one hour or 30 minutes were paid the same as those who worked all day long. It's just not right. And as a lawyer, Phil had a problem with that. A lot of people have a problem. A lot of people have a problem with grace because, you see, they just don't understand it. Grace, my friend, is getting what you don't deserve. Not a single one of us here this morning deserves salvation, not one. And yet that's the way we all receive it. For by grace are you saved through faith. That's story number one. The workers in the vineyard, they got what they didn't deserve. My second story concerning the grace of God is taken from the Old Testament. And it shows what kindness is all about. I need to set this one in context for you. You remember that Saul was the king of Israel who had a real problem with young David when he came along because David was sort of a military hero and he would win the battles and the people would march him through the streets and all of that. And Saul had a real problem with young David. It just so happened, stay with me now, that Saul had a son named Jonathan. And though Saul hated David, Jonathan and David were the best of friends. So you remember the story that uh, Saul in due time died and David became king and is known today as the greatest king that Israel ever had. After being on the throne for a while, David decided as a result of my being the king and Saul who used to be king, I'm going to see if I can find a descendant of Saul somewhere and show some kind of uh, love and compassion for him. This is all over in the book of 2 Samuel. And so they did the research on it, and they found out that uh, Jonathan, the son of Saul, Jonathan had a handicapped son. He was an invalid. He couldn't walk. His, anybody in this room know his name? You do. His name was Meshibabeth. I'm going to talk to Jared and Catherine about this because when they have their next child, I think Meshibabeth would be a good name for that baby. And so uh, I'll talk to them about that later. But anyway, they found, they found out where the boy was. He was an invalid. He was a cripple. He couldn't walk. David, uh, David said to his uh, servants, I want you to go get the boy, and I want you to bring him to the palace, and he's going to live in the palace with us. Now, they went and found the boy. They brought him in. He couldn't walk. They brought him in and set him down in front of the king right there while he was sitting on his throne. And David let him know that he was welcome to the kingdom. He was welcome to the palace. And as long as he was there, he would be cared for and taken care of by the king and all of his servants, and he was. And as far as we know, that that boy, who was an invalid and a cripple, lived in the palace of the king of Israel until his passing death. Now, in reading that story we find a definition of grace. 
Because you see, once again, we find that in this story, that grace is getting what you don't deserve. That boy, his daddy, his grandfather had been an avowed enemy of King David, had tried to kill him several different times. And now here was this grandson who was an invalid to start with, who couldn't do a thing in the palace to help anybody. And yet David reaches out to him, takes care of him, nurtures him, and loves him. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. That's the second illustration. The third one is not in the Bible, but it's in the hymn book. And that's the hymn that we were singing a while ago, written by a, name, name, a man named John Newton. John Newton was born in London in 1725. He grew up in a family that le left some things to be desired and began sailing with his father when he was 11 years old. In due time, he got on a military vessel where he deserted it because he was not being treated properly. And as a result of his de uh, deserting the military vessel, then he became a slave on another vessel. He was abused as a young man. And in due time, he ended up as a member of a slave ship that bought and sold slaves out of England. In due time, he not only became a member of that slave ship, but became a captain of a ship himself, John Newton. One night during a very violent storm, very violent storm, he was afraid that he and all of his shipmates were going to be killed. And in that time of great need, he asked God for mercy. And he received God's mercy. In due time, he came under the influence of two of the great preachers of that day. One was John Whitfield, the other was John Wesley, not Elliot, but just John Wesley, the Methodist preacher. And John Newton, the man who was... Uh, reprobate, ex-slave, traitor, hater of men, taking, selling and buying slaves, became a child of God. And in due time, John Newton wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost, but now I've been found. I was blind, but now I see. What is grace? Did John Newton deserve to be a child of God? Did he deserve to go? And no, he didn't deserve anything. He'd done everything wrong in life that you, can hard, that you can even imagine. But he became a child of God wrote the hymn Amazing Grace that has probably had more influence on individuals worldwide than any single song that's ever been written. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. The vineyard, the workers in the vineyard couldn't understand it, especially those that went to work at 8 o'clock in the morning and got paid the same as those that went for an hour or so in the afternoon. But that's grace. The, the grandson of Saul, Meshibabeth, didn't deserve to be reared in the king's palace, but he was. He got what he didn't deserve. John Newton didn't deserve to be a child of God. But when you get to heaven, maybe he'll sing amazing grace for you. Grace is getting what we don't deserve.
Now, I've given you the theology of all of this, or some, most of it. I want to give you a closing example that explains it for me better than anything else. You know what that is? A parking meter. A parking meter. Now, let me explain it. Our church in Alexandria was on Washington Street in downtown Alexandria. The church office, the only thing between us and the street was a sidewalk. The sidewalk from where the pastor's study was, was as close to me as Terry is sitting there this morning. And on that street, there were parking meters. If you would go to Alexandria tomorrow morning, and 10 minutes after 9, if you pulled up in front of the church, I say that because you can't park there until after 9 o'clock because of the bus lanes. But if you'd park there 10 minutes after 9, you're going to have to feed a parking meter. Therefore, during my time in Alexandria, whenever I went anywhere and found a parking meter with time left on it, you know what I did? I took advantage of it, and I parked at that parking meter. Now here's, this has nothing to do with theology, but it's a truth if ever I've told it. Grace is parking on somebody else's nickel. You see, somebody else has already paid the price. I shouldn't even mention this whole thing because the mayor is here this morning and he's probably going to go back this week and want to put parking meters on the streets of Warsaw. And if he does that, he's going to have to deal with this preacher, you know, because anyway. But anyway, grace, when somebody else has paid the price, parking on somebody else's meter. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Saved a wretch like me. Once was lost, but now I've been found. I'm blind, but now I'm able to see. Guess what we're going to sing as our closing hymn? We've already sung it two times. Will three times matter? It won't matter. We need to hear the words. But listen to this now. It's our closing hymn. It's our hymn of invitation and commitment. Because there may be someone here this morning who says, I know about grace. I've heard those songs. I've read that verse in the Bible. But you've never made a public commitment of your life to Jesus and followed him through the baptismal waters and committed your life. To so it's an invitation time as well. But for you and your need, whatever that need may be, we're going to sing Amazing Grace one more time. And you can bear witness to your faith even in your singing. Let's stand. Let's sing it together, please.
thank you again for your presence and attentiveness and trust that some words have been shared to encourage someone to mock today. Keep in mind, next Sunday there will be a connection because we're going to talk about assurance. Today was God's salvation by grace, but can we really be sure that we know that we know that we know? Guess what we're going to sing? Blessed assurance. And so, we hope you'll be here and even bring a friend. Let's pray. Father, it's been good to be in your house today. Thank you for each one who is here. May we take away a blessing with us as we continue on in the journey before us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.